Hello, my name is Harald Benz. I am co-chair of the Humanities Department here at Bethany and welcome you to another installment of the Bethany Connect Speaker Series. This is the first part of a double header today, um, as at 4 p.m. Dr. Ian Lanzolani will present the origins of the Russo-Ukrainian War, Putin's historical delusions, competing national visions and politics of NATO enlargement. So um, we hope to see you again today at 4 p.m. Right now, however, I am here as the advisor of our Fulbright Foreign Language Teaching Assistants, the FLTAs for short, who are our featured speakers during our lunch hour today. Bethany has hosted FLTAs since the 2011-2012 academic year, starting with an FLTA for Arabic language and culture, but soon adding Chinese and later French, German and Spanish. The FLTA program is jointly funded by the United States Department of State Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs, the ECA, and the host institutions, making it a cost-efficient way to bring young professionals from around the world to our campus to teach languages and cultures that otherwise would be out of the reach for a small liberal arts college. The program enables us, in combination with our resident faculty, to offer seven world languages and cultures for our students. As part of the program, the FLTAs not only teach their respective languages and civilization courses, they also are available as guest speakers for, our, for other courses and engage in outreach activities, COVID permitting. In addition, they also take a couple of courses each semester and add a little international flavor to those courses. In short, together with the other 50 plus international students and faculty, they are Bethany's window to the world. And that is something that is sorely needed in times of international conflict and enforced isolation. The three women who will be presenting today are first, Shayma Kulab. Shaymar comes to us from Gaza in the Palestinian territories. She will invite us to, uh, to follow her into her complicated life in her home, focusing on the role of women in, their, in that society, but she will also talk about what her Fulbright year means to her. The second speaker will be Océane Arger from France. Océane will lead us on a little excursion into French language policy and linguistics, focusing on the sometimes controversial role of the French language society. Last, but certainly not least, Mariela Zayas will introduce us to aspects of her home culture, Argentina, hopefully without making our large group of Argentinian students too homesick. The presenters have decided to leave a few minutes for questions after each presentation, so please don't hesitate to ask. So without any further ado, I'd like to welcome Shema Kulab to the podium. Hi, it's my pleasure to be with you today to talk about my country and uh, about women uh, in Gaza. Uh, first, before starting to talk about the situation and the status of women in Gaza, I would like to, to share with you the location of my country, Palestine, so here on the map we can see Palestine, um, and uh, Palestine is an area in the Eastern Mediterranean region between Jordan River and the uh, Mediterranean Sea in Asia, as here we can see. Sorry, as here we can see, uh, and this region has a strategic location between Jordan in the east, Lebanon to the north, and Mediterranean Sea to the west of Palestine and Gulf of Aqaba to the south. Syria, Egypt, and the Arabian na nations are, are its neighboring uh, countries. Uh, so maybe because of their location, we have a lot of conflicts in, in Palestine because of that with uh, the, the Israel side. So, so um, the, uh, about the Palestinian women in Gaza. Uh, the Palestinian women in Gaza Strip live in difficult conditions as a result of the deteriorating uh, internal political, economic, and social conditions under the offenses of the ongoing occupation. And beside of that, we have the Palestinian division and the imposed siege on the Gaza Strip. So one of the um, interesting information about Gaza Strip that we have 
um, a total blockage uh, over the area for many, many years. So as a result of that, we have um, really bad conditions that affect on uh, the society and especially on women. Uh, living conditions under occupation are made worse for women under the prevailing culture and the Palestinian laws that leave women exposed to violence and discrimination. And I would like to share with you a quick points uh, about the, uh, the things that the women face in Gaza. Um, I cannot really cover everything because of the limited time, but here we have gender-based violence. Uh, significantly, there is a law, there is no law in Gaza that that uh, uh, prohibits uh, violence against women within the family, sexual violence included. So that's the um, that's the worst point. That if we have a problems or if we have to, to issue and to file any issue uh, for women against men, we cannot and we we will not have that support from society and from uh, government and policy for that. Um, when women do manage to submit an official complaint, they, they find that their complaints are not given adequate attention and are often ignored completely. In the absence of uh, necessary laws and, and law en uh, enforcement mechanisms, violence against women continues at alarming rates. Um, almost 16.7% of, uh, of girls aged 12 to 17 reported, uh, reported undergoing physical or psychological violence at the hands of teachers or classmates. Um, and for me, we have a lot, for me, from my point of view, we have a lot of girls and women that we don't know about them and they can, and also they cannot report about their, about their violence or the, the, the conditions of life that they live. So maybe we have like a higher of that rate. So 51% um, uh, of married women in Gaza have admitted to being victims of some forms of violence from their husbands, uh, be it uh, physical, sexual, uh, psychological, economic, or social. And uh, in, in the society when, when, when we live there, like really we can hear a lot of stories, the daily stories that, that we can listen, that women, they really got, uh, uh, got offended by, by their husbands and they cannot do anything. Uh, and, they, uh, and even they cannot have a safe a place or safe environment for them. Also here, uh, I will talk about the lack of opportunities in Gaza. A woman face um, really widespread discrimination in the economic and social sectors um, with limited employment opportunities. So uh, we have the stereotype in Gaza that they will prefer for uh, they will prefer to give the chances for men to to work and to have um, really a chance for a, a good job uh, comparing to women because we have they have the belief and we have the belief that men are, uh, are responsible for uh, all the financial support for the house and for the family so. When, when it comes to they have to choose between men and women, they, they will choose men over women for work. Um, and another point that we have really well-educated women and a lot of women that they finish um, their high education and, and PhD and still we don't have that um, great chances to find job and really to start our career path in Gaza. Um, and also here we have um, uh, women participation in the, in the Gaza labor force is among the, the lowest in the world at about 22% uh, the global average of 50%. Also, only 7% of employed, employed women in Gaza are employers while 81 are wage employees of those women who are unemployed. 
9% uh, is due to, to housekeeping and, and just 28 is due to studying or training. And also, uh, one of the uh, stereotypes that I dislike and I totally disagree that um, so the society look for uh, look on the women. If you work and if you have like a good position position in society, that means that you are strong enough. You are independent, and if you are, it's just just staying at home and um, making the house work and uh, help your children in, in, in their studies that you are not independent woman. So uh, I disagree because the only difference, they, they didn't get a chance to have a job as in other countries. Also, here we have a good point about um, uh, women in Gaza. We have women that uh, take a place in political positions and we have a women's political participation. In November 2013, Hamas, it's like a um, um, political group in Gaza, uh, appointed Sratnik Dalla to be its first English language spoken person in a bid to show a progress face to its international audience. So we have a woman that they can serve in, in different um, ministries and also a spoken person. Uh, but, but they are not really uh, big numbers that they represent us. So the government included only one female minister out of 25. Uh, seven years later, in 2014, the next attempt um, in the government again included only one woman, Haifa uh, al-Arab, uh, in that same position, so we only have like two uh, women uh, served as uh, ministers in the government. Uh, that was a quick, inf the quick information headlines about the the women in Gaza, and I would like to share with you my experience in in Bethany, the experience that I considered it's my my turning life, turning point of my life. Um, my story is a little bit a little bit different because I got accepted into a full priority program in 2020, and um, I couldn't travel from Palestine to uh, to the U.S. Not only because of COVID pandemic, uh, but also because the blockage and the, um, the closure that we have over the Gaza Strip uh, that controlled by Israel side. So. So the good point that I started to work uh, remotely uh, in, in Bethany College, um, I was teaching Arabic language courses and I was helping in um, religious course, courses with other professors. So, uh, so from, that from that moment, I, I really felt that I have friends yeah, overseas for the first time in my life. That, that really was an interesting uh, feeling. And by the time I felt I'm super, I feel like I felt I'm excited just to go out of Gaza to meet them, to see them in person, um, because now I have I have an image like I I have an image for the people there, how they are nice, how they are friendly, and one of my uh, interesting situations that I will not forget during the war in Gaza, uh, the last war it was on May before leaving Gaza. Uh, the professors and my supervisor Harlan, they really, they really uh, showed showed me a lot of attention about Gaza situation, about any any women that can live in Gaza and that in that conditions it worse. And they they kept checking on me and sending sending me messages really every day and almost every four hours. So I in that in that days I felt like I matter and my. Uh, and our our issue as a Palestinian can be really a strong voice in Western societies, and now they are educated about us, and also they 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 feel um, that um, that uh, mercy with us and like that, that they support us. Um, and when I when after a long uh, and difficult uh, trip, when I arrived to Bethany, the the things that shocked me like people and the students when I started to work around the campus, 
people start to call my name and like say hi Shem and oh they remember me and I only I was virtually and and it was over Zoom and I I I didn't create that strong bond with with the students in, in campus. So I felt so happy that at least they remember my name and they just came and say hi and we remember you. You can't imagine the impact that left that Bethany uh, community and Bethany College left on me. How how um, uh, my, how uh, how my horizon how how the experience exp uh, expand my horizon my horizons and my ways of thinking and how they everyone is really so friendly. When I, when I'm telling my friends about how my life here in Bethany the other Fulbrighters in the U.S., they, they envy me for this community and like, oh, you are lucky with the supervisors, you are lucky with the, all the people and the professors and the students. And also I got lucky to got to know international people and the students all over the world, from Argentina, from France, from Ethiopia, also from Nepal. So it was... Um, you know, it, it, it's a good point about Bethany that the cultures and all the internationals that they, they can meet together. And I lived with other Fulbrighters from Argentina and the friends that I will not forget about them. They, I, I learned a lot of things from, uh, from them and from their uh, countries. Now I can really, uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm too into their cultures and I can understand them very well. Um, Beside all of these points about the community and the social life here, I'm so glad that I had a chance for to learn from different courses and from different professors here in Bethany. And almost for two years, it's not like as the usual for one year. So uh, for all the knowledge, all the skills that I gained in, in, in Bethany also. Um, one, um, I think one, one last point, uh, just to end really, I felt myself here. I feel, you can imagine how I feel that I, I have a positive, strong voice that I can change the, the world back home or any place that I go. I, I felt, um, and I'm still feeling it, like I'm so happy to educate my students in Arabic civilization about different informations in, in the Middle East and uh, about, um, uh, also I'm so proud to teach them about my religion, Islam, and just to try to correct the image and the stereotypes that, that they have about Muslims and Islam. I felt I'm, I'm strong, independent, yeah, women in the US, you know, it's so hard to leave the country, uh, to, to, to leave Gaza because it's not about the occupation, it's also about that the families that that they are there, a lot of families they uh, they don't allow their daughters just to travel across the um, over the seas and just to be for here alone one year. So I'm glad that I I made it to the U.S. and I really uh, I wish also to come back here to 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 complete my studies. So uh, uh, if you have any questions about the situation in Gaza, about women, or about even my uh, ex experience in Bethany, I would love to hear from your questions. Are there any questions? I have yes. So, Clayman, you were mentioning that you don't have a law for women, even that is for working, that there is no law for making these people, no? Yeah, no, we, we don't have. Yeah, they barely even women. They barely they they barely even for men to find job in Gaza. So we don't have that because from the beginning we have um, a bigger problem with unemployment. So. So um, I have a question. Yes, go um, ahead. Education seems to be accessible for women in Gaza, but yeah. it's not followed up by by jobs afterwards. Yeah, that? for sure. Yeah. Uh, uh, the belief or the, the thing that's going on in Gaza, uh, all families support their daughters to complete their studies and to finish bachelor. But we have, in the same time, we have a lot of families that they don't allow their daughters, their, the women, to complete their studies. Even like they will finish the high school and that's it, you will stay at home. 
so the problem not about it's not about education. It's about the, the life after education, the career life that we want to really uh, uh, live and uh, get experience in, in work. Another question? Before? Thank you. We thank you. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you very much, Shema. Um, we have Ocean Arjé next, and she's going to get her PowerPoint started, I guess. Right? Uh, out of seven 
134 members and it was created, so which tend to make French language masculine at least. So my first example for that is the basic, basic gender agreement rule is to say masculine or the feminine. So if you have a group, like in this picture, there are five girls, one boy, masculine is dominant according to French karma. So we will be referring to that group as it was a group of boys, not a group made of boys and women. No matter how many women there are in a group, as long as there's one man in this group, the group becomes a masculine group. This rule has been created by the French Academy. Like, they literally made it up because before that we used to have what they call like, the proximity agreement rule. It's like whatever was closer to the verb in the sentence will be the agreement. So it could be feminine or masculine, just makes sense when you're speaking it. But it has been changed to this rule. Uh, we can also see that like with the masculine agreement rule, they also have like an entire new terminology. The word on, spelled with a normal eat, uh, it's just used to refer to a man. But if you put it with a capital H, it would not be used to refer to all human. So this is something that you can find in the Declaration of Human Rights that was written during the French Revolution. And that in French is called La Déclaration des Droits de l'Homme, like only the Declaration of Men and Not Women. So in response to that, during the French Revolution, there held so, so the first French feminist movement that was led by this woman that was called Hollande de Gouche. And she's mostly remembered to be the author of the Declaration of Human Rights, the Déclaration des Droits de la Femme, as opposed to the Declaration of Human Rights, that was called Men's Rights in French. So in the late 18th century, uh, it marks the beginning of the early questioning on language as a vector of sexist bias, and also then as a feminist tool. As a response to this feminine movement, the French Academy deleted and forbade all new, oh, by new, all the use of feminine, like feminine terms to describe jobs. Uh, so it just basically meant that if there was no more word to call this job, women could not do it. So the point was that women writers that we were calling autrices in French were using their work to promote feminist ideas but if there were no word to call their job, they could not do it anymore and they will stop promoting their ideas. That was the idea behind to learn. So all this job were replaced by their generic masculine form. So there were still women that were writers, but we will call them male writers. But they were still doing that job. And this is something that has been going on since. So as in 2014, uh, we had kind of similar case in the National Assembly. So although today most of this term are back in use, they were not officially allowed until 2019. So in 2014, a French deputy made news by refusing to call the president of the National Assembly by a feminine title. So instead of calling her Madame La Présidente, he called her Madame Le Président. This is what the French Academy says he should be saying. But the president actually made him repeat it three times, and three times he kept saying masculine terms, so he's been suspended for that. And that's in this year that all the debates about should we make language more feminine as far as we can. So the question is not should we make French language inclusive, but should we make it inclusive again, because feminine words did exist. Um, it started in the 1960s, 70s. In the old Francophone word, like French language has been going through a moderniz modernization process in parallel to like the movement of women's lib worldwide, but not in France because of the national, uh, of the French academy that was really, really like strictly opposed to it. Uh, so in France, we had to wait until 2019 and a presidential request to finally get a law that allows back the use of feminine terms for jobs or old shops, even the one that did not exist has been created at that time. Another, another way that we have to make French language more inclusive is inclusive writing. 
So it's again independently from the French Academy that is opposed to it, but French language has developed the inclusive writing. It's a type of language that we find in many languages. Uh, in French, it has three principles. The first one is to use feminine version as often as possible, so anytime one exists, you should use it. And also to avoid any like masculine generic terms that are totally like about saying love to refer to human, you should not be doing that. That's the two main principle. Those are quite accepted and applied, but the third one is more complicated and not everybody agrees on. It deleted generic masculine forms to create mixed form that would combine both masculine and feminine atom. So as here, to get citoyen and citoyen, we just make an, a word of it using a dot. And also a new pronoun has been created to refer to both men and women. This also includes um, like non-binary but in English you use they. We try to have a French equivalent to that, but it did not work out at a point where inclusive writing has been banned from French school in 2021. It's actually a law by the Minister of Education. Any teacher using inclusive writing would be fired. <laughs> it's really not into consideration at all. And all documents from the government must not use inclusive writing too. That's a law. And the question is why inclusive writing is not going into standard French. The thing is that it's not about just not being in it, but is that French language has like a long history of prescription and stereotypes about the language, the language you're speaking and how it shapes the image that you show in people. And it's still the thing that back to the creation of the French Academy in 1635. And it was that has been created to avoid using dialects and it's still the same today. If you're not using stand French, you're making a political act if you refuse to use it. So as a French teacher here, I was teaching French for the first time and I was constantly trying and going back and forth between teaching proper standard French and trying not to convey all the gender bias that I've just presented. I was constantly asking myself, what should I teach? What would be better to teach? Should I teach 10 French or should I try to teach more inclusive French? That would definitely upset the French Academy. So one of the only way that I found to answer this question is to wonder what I was teaching French. One of the things that I want my student to do is that I want them to be able to communicate efficiently in French. But I also want them to make sure that they get enough cultural background to be able to understand the meaning of the word to use. So anytime I teach them, I did teach them the neutral pronoun. The first class we met, but I made sure they knew it was not in use everywhere, that if they were using it, they were actually taking political position for French government. But finally, to conclude, I'd like to say that teaching French here this year has helped me a lot to reflect on my own language, as I always ask myself, is it okay for my son to say that in French to somebody else than me? Thank you. Other questions? try to impose, uh, so right now the basic rule is generic masculine and she's trying to impose generic feminine. So anytime she want to talk about a group of people, depending like if they're men or female on it, she's just going to say women. So she's trying to impose that because she's a linguist and that she's in, that's an experiment she's trying to carry and she's trying to see if people are going to actually use it if she does it, but that's the only time I've had it. I don't think they could, but they're making rules 
and like as I said, they're making the language so important in the French culture that even if your grammar is not perfect, that's going to be hard to have a job in that case. It's just like they're making sure that language is going to be told the proper way, and if it's not, like it can be a shame for you. <laughs> so, how does, does that translate into language teaching too? I mean, uh, is there a, 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 a real concentration on correctness? Yeah, I think so. Uh, especially when I had like French classes. So I had French classes from elementary school to university. Like as long as you're in school, we have French classes. And it's mostly we did not do a lot of literature, literature as they do here, but we do a lot of grammar, like just writing sentences, making sure like the plural agreement is respected, and things like that. We don't read a lot, but we do a lot of grammar. Mm -hmm. So you say that you can be Yeah, usually it's like more gonna be like the parents from the students that are like, oh, I said I had my son's not good again. Thank you very much. And finally, we will have Mariela Zayas from Argentina. <laughs> who is going to um, talk about her culture. And she dressed. Wow. I know, that's great. So, hello everybody. I know that you are tired, so I will invite you just to stand up for a second. Can you stand up? So, so we refresh our minds. <laughs> Now you can feel again, you can move, if I can feel again. So I will share with you about my culture and also about experience here in Bethany. First, I would like you to show you my family. I have a big family because I have five siblings. And then I have ten nieces, like you can see them in the picture. And while well, that is my boyfriend also in the picture. So that is my big, big family. And those are the topics I will share with you. First of all, I will talk about where is Corrientes, because when people say Argentina, they usually say Buenos Aires, and Buenos Aires is not the only place, and it's the capital city, and everybody, like, for me, I am happy that they are not here now, because they don't speak the proper Spanish, you know? <laughs> so it's like, uh, sometimes we have conflicts with that. Uh, then I will share something about food, about music, and because we are like in women's man, I will show you one woman that I admire, that is Soledad Pastoruti, she's a singer. And then, last, uh, the full experience. So, where is Corrientes? If you see the map, like you have Argentina, and then you have Corrientes at the top, like, we are close to Paraguay, and we are close to Brazil as well. So, my province, because we are separated in provinces in Argentina, is like mixed culture. My parents are from Paraguay, so like I have a cross-culture experience there. And those are some pictures. Uh, over there, like what is the most famous tourist attraction? is the riverside. As you can see, like we have the river. That is why I love the beach. I don't have a sea, but I have a river where I go, like usually. And also because the temperature is so different from the temperature here, we use Celsius, not Fahrenheit. But um, it's going to be like in winter, the maximum Yes, the maximum, the most cold day is going to be 32. 32 Fahrenheit. No, not Celsius, not Celsius. <laughs> <laughs> and also, I show a picture of a capybara. I don't know if you know it, um, because we have a natural reserve. That is the Ibera wetlands. It was in the news recently, for a bad reason, because of some fire. I don't know if you heard about it, but well. Some of those animals live there. Well, now about food. Um, the food is different for me for me here because um, 
We have other dishes that I cannot find here, so that is why I share with you some of them. For example, um, alfajor is a sweet. I don't know if you have ever tried it, if you have ever heard about it, no. Uh, or pan pancakes with dulce de leche, well, oh, she's gonna kill me, because it's like a crab with dulce de leche, but we call them pancakes with dulce de leche. And then, well, the barbecue is something that um, is my favorite food. Um, I usually eat that with my family, it's like a tradition. Usually on Sundays, you, you meet with your family, so you spend the time together and you share a meal. And then there are others. And mate, that is a traditional drink. I don't know, well, maybe you saw it around campus. Um, I know that because of COVID and because of culture, for you it's like a shock because we share that. And people say like, how can you share that? And it is because it's part of tradition and it's part of culture as well. Like, Usually, you share mate with your friends, with your family, and it's like, it has like a magic power. People said that it has a magic power that make you talk and not look at your cell phone. That nowadays, like, people are in, in the other world, like, leading technology. But with mate, you share, and you can share it, like, in the morning, in the afternoon, at any time. And you can also eat that, drink that, sorry, with chipacitos. That is something that I brought. I don't know if some of you tried today. Um, facturas, that is sweet. That is kind of similar maybe to France, the facturas. I don't know what you call No? OK. Well, about the music, um, as Harald said, that I was dressed. I am dressed because I am representing chamame, that is a typical dance in Corrientes. Like you will see the dancers like dressing like this. And then you have tango, but tango is like only popular in Buenos Aires. So sorry to disappoint you, but it's like the other people from the other areas uh, is gonna know more about folk music or cumbia than tango. So um, there is a big festival in my province that is the Chamame Festival. And that is how you dress and you go and people sing there, like you attend a show and you can eat as well. Well, that is tango, it is like known all around. So that is why I wanted to share Chamame as well. And finally, well, not finally, then I have the experience, but about music and culture. Uh, La Sole, or Soledad, is the woman that I choose because I admire her. She is a singer. Uh, she's an Argentinian folk singer. She was born in Santa Fe, Argentina. And her songs are about the beauty of the country, social topics, and love. So why do I choose her? Because she usually respects everybody's side. She usually talks about um, social problems that we live in a good way, not like attacking the government, but trying to find a solution. So that is why I like her. Um, well, she is part also of the Chamame Festival, usually. So it's, a, it's an important moment for me. Um, that is her. I don't know if you ever heard about her your life? Maybe not, but, well, now you learn something. <laughs> and about the football experience. Um, what I think, well, teaching Spanish here is, as Ocean said before, like, makes me reflect about my own language, because usually, like, in Argentina, I teach English. So, like, here, coming here, I think that uh, you develop awareness of the linguistic structure and you learn more about your own language because it's not the same that you know it, like I know how to speak it because I was born there. But okay, like when my students ask like, 
I'm like, what is going on here? And it's like, for me, it's like common sense, but there is a rule behind that, so I have to study that as well, like to understand why this is happening in the language, to be able to explain to them. So I like that because I gain more experience, I learn as well. Um, also, I think that living abroad is the best way to learn about other points of view. Uh, living with Ocean Shema, I learn about other cultures and uh, meeting other international friends and meeting you as well as you are here. Like, I think that we can have different perspectives and that is, like, we are all different and that is okay. Like, we are going to be different. But um, the point is that we respect each other ideas. And then I also want to share with you that I learn with my students because usually like when I don't know something about English I ask them and I learn with them. Also I learn about um, their feelings, their opinions about a topic so that is good. I have a different perspective and I have a North American perspective. And I, I can say that I met amazing people, thank you to the Fulbright program. And this is the last, and we made a snowman. I know that's horrible, but we did it. Like, it was my first time doing a snowman, so I enjoyed that. And then that is Christmas with the girls. We made like a Christmas party before traveling. And then that is just um, a picture of the, camp, of the campus. So I want to say thanks to Bethany for having me here, and thanks to them for being Thank you. Are there any questions?
in this in Spanish, we, it's like French, like we have feminine and masculine, and, and as she said, there is no logical reason, like you just know this is feminine, this is masculine, but usually like uh, there are some grammar rules according to the ending of the word, for example, but not because of the meaning of the word. So it's COVID, feminine, or masculine? I don't know, uh, COVID is, uh, is masculine. masculine, el COVID, yes, for me, like in Spanish. neutral that can go for both but in that case we change the article that goes before that like for example student is going to be la estudiante or el estudiante according to this any other questions well then i would like to thank you very much and Thank you all very much for coming um, online and the few people who made it out to uh, Phillips Hall. Um, I guess we, we have to get used to in-person uh, experiences again. Um, if you uh, are so inclined, you know about the four o'clock event um, in the same place. There will be food again. so. Um, come out and see Dr. Lanzalotti, but I'd like to right now once again thank our Fulbright FLTAs for their contribution to our campus culture. And uh, I wish you all the best. You're not leaving yet. Okay. <laughs> thank you all.